praise the Lord that uh, we're here tonight, I'm here tonight, and I want to give him thanks before we start for all that he's done, all that he's going to do, now and in the future for everybody. But I also have to give thanks to my wife, because without her love, without her care, without her following what it says in the Bible about love, I wouldn't be here tonight. For the very simple reason, we got married and four months, 19 days, and 19 hours after we got married, she walked out of the house on a Saturday night, went to a meeting in our local park and came back with what we call a born-again Christian. That freaked me out. I hadn't got a clue what happened. All of a sudden, I was the, her love, and then this thing called, this person called Jesus came into the life and into in between us, and I didn't know. So it took six years. We're a stubborn lot. It took six years of prayer, love, and heartache. It, sometimes it nearly ended the marriage. My, my t- what I'm talking about tonight is not our testimony. That, that may be an, another time. But it took six years of her loving me, showing me what real love was about, so that I could come into the kingdom. And I came into the kingdom, and uh, a few months after I gave my life, we went over to Tulsa to my first uh, Christian conference. I hadn't got a clue what to expect. But in that conference... The Lord spoke to Julie and said, write a book, and this is the title, When Your Partner Doesn't Know Jesus. And in there, I want you to write all the lessons that I taught you and all the lessons that you've learnt, which was, for some things, I got a bigger glass of wine and she got the smaller glass. I got a nice cut of meat, whereas before it was reverse. We're laughing at it now, but when we went out to Uganda a couple of years ago, Julie spoke about this, and it impacted one lady at a conference there, so much so that she changed how she treated her husband. Her husband was a Muslim. And instead of feeding him chicken, she used to feed him rat and other things. But it taught her, and she changed, and she's seen a change in attitude for him. So we know that this book has been out on... Uh, it's been around, around the world. It, we've been on uh, Club 700 talking about the book. And it's a real good book in terms of... It's very simple to read. A couple of hours it, it's, it's read, but the lessons in there are, are quite profound. So I mean, I'm holding one here, and I'm hoping that... To, or not, does anyone here have a partner that doesn't know Jesus yet? Or does anyone here know... So do you, your partner doesn't know Jesus? We would like to bless you with that book. Thank you. Enjoy it. Okay, so I'm Michael Allen. This is Julie. What we do, we, uh, Julie and I run a, a training business called Allen Partnership, uniquely named after ourselves because we couldn't think of, a, of another name. And it's around leadership and personal development as well as employment law, which is Julie's specialist. If that isn't, wasn't enough, six years ago we set up a charity called Be Who You Can Be. And its aim there was to reach the lost and hurting in a, without mentioning Jesus in terms of going out and preaching. And it's, it had some tremendous results because Jesus said to us, put my name above it and I will bring the people. And for those six years, starting off from very small beginnings, we've now seen a, an increasing number of people coming through some of our training and teaching in that. And the last program that we've just finished, I think 66 people that we've trained over the last five months, that's three Three day, uh, seven three-day programs. And out of that, I think there's about 30 people who were Christians who came onto the program, all of which have been set free from the mindset. So that's what we do within, in, with outside the church in terms of the, the charity. In fact, if I'm right, we had one lady who said, the Holy Spirit just turned up one day. Well, he turns up every day we go there because we give it to him. And Judy was the main uh, teaching on that, and I was bringing people in, as it were, and um, gave the, the whole program to him. And I think one lady said, I don't know who this person Jesus is, but I'm like a dog with a bone. I'm going to chase him, I'm going to find him, and I'm going to hunt him down. Praise God. And we've had so many testimonies from that. It's been incredible. And again, if that wasn't enough, two years after Judy gave her life, the Lord told her to get my people to be more, he didn't use these exact words, but it says in the Bible, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So about teaching people to be assertive in how they deal with one another. And if we are assertive with one another, then they're going to cause no offence. 
But it was great, or not great, but see how much opposition came to say you can't teach that in the church. But the program is named after the ministry. It's called Be Who You Can Be in Christ. There's an outline of the program at the back there, as well as Julie's books. And that program, we've taken that uh, in various churches uh, in terms of teaching it there. We've taken it out to East Africa, to Kenya and Uganda. Uh, and we've taught it in our own church now. We reside, as it, if that's the right word, at Revival Fires uh, with Trevor and Sharon Baker in Dudley. We're part of the, uh, the leadership team there. We run a home group there. We're also associates with the church. Uh, we're part of the pastoral team. And for the last four years, we've taught our program, Be Who Can Be in Christ, to the, the uh, candidates or the, the kids who come on to the School of the Supernatural. And it's had a real impact because it's about releasing. The ministry is about releasing people into their destinies. And I've listened to a few tapes uh, that you have on Tash Jesus' website and, and listened to that. And that's been a theme, hasn't it, for, for the last few months, getting people released into their destiny. Because you don't know, I don't know. One word from you to speak into somebody else's life could change their course of their life forever. Surely that's what it's about, what we're doing. It doesn't matter who we are. If we're about being encouragers to other people. So that's what we do. We try and encourage people and try and have a laugh because we never know what the Lord's going to do. And if you wake up each day anxious and thinking, what's going to happen today, then I don't know. don't know about you, but I like to just wake up each day and say, okay, where are we going today? What are we doing today? Who do you want me to see? Who do you want me to speak to? And whether it's in the Christian content or whether it's with the charity, he always finds a way of coming in. He always finds a way of opening the doors, opening somebody's heart for, to allow him to get in there and start working with people. So tonight, I think it says on the fly, I really want to talk about the Valley of Cast Sheep. Now, I don't know whether you know anything about the Valley of the Cast Sheep, but we, in our home group, um, done a six weeks Bible study on Psalm 23. So it's out of Psalm 23. I'm going to talk about that. And it's not a face-to-face, bang-on preach. This is a gentle teach, which I know what he's blessed us with. It's a gentle teach, and I hope your hearts and souls are open tonight to look at this. And it was interesting with one of the songs Treflin sang there, because I I wrote on my bit of paper this morning, uh, this little bit here was, lift us up on eagle's wings. And he said that it will be spoken tonight. And it's about getting us lifting up, isn't it? It's not saying we're down here in the ground, we're up. We're supposed to be flying with eagles having the eyesight of eagles, being able to see farther than anybody else, to fly farther than anybody else, to impact with people. So Psalm 23. Two quotes I want to start off with tonight. Abraham Lincoln once said, and in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. Think about how we can impact on everybody. Instead of looking at self, it's how can I impact and help somebody else. And somebody once said, faith is like electricity. You can't see it, but you need the light. Yeah, faith is like electricity, but you can see the light. It's amazing that. We know it's there, and we rely on it to switch it on. And I think all of us, sometimes, we do need that little bit of light with Jesus <coughs> just to lift us up and to encourage us. How I wanted to start off tonight is really putting things into perspective. I don't know whether anybody's ever seen any of the films that go around on YouTube in terms of looking at size, looking at the size of our Earth, comparing it to other planets in the solar system. Has anybody ever seen videos of that? Yeah? Well, basically what this starts off with, it just looks at the size of the planets in our solar system. It looks at the size of the Earth, then they get bigger and bigger till you get to the sun. You think, wow, that is huge. I believe you can fit one million Earths into the sun. It's huge, isn't it? It's big. But remember, God created all this. Okay, so I want to put it into perspective. And then if you go out into the universe further, they've discovered more planets. I think the next planet, or the next solar system, the next sun, is five times bigger than our own sun. Then they go to another planet. I Forgive me, I can't remember the names. They're quite long. I wish they make them ABC. It's much, much easier to look at. But the next planet is something like 400 times bigger than our sun, which that would stretch from here to Jupiter. That's a bit farther than I can catch the number 59 bus or wherever it is, but it's far, isn't it? Yeah. Then you go to the last planet, the one that they know about now, the largest sun they've ever, ever discovered, which is 
Let me make sure I get this right. It's one billion times bigger than our own sun. God created all this. And if you were to fly on a commercial airliner, traveling at 900 kilometers per hour, it would take you 1,100 years to go around once. See, now God created all that, but he holds the earth in the palm of his hands. He holds you in the palm of your hands, his hands rather. So it's about I'm trying to put that into perspective. Do you look at, I can't imagine the, another planet, another sun that's a billion times bigger than our own, and it'll take 1,100 years to go around. Amazing, isn't it? But he holds, he created all that. And then when we come all the way back down into earth, we look at what we consider are our problems, and really, they're insignificant. They're really insignificant compared to God who spoke and out of his mouth came everything that we know. In Isaiah 61, 66, 1, it says, Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house would you build for me? What kind of house is your body for him? What kind of building do you have for the Lord? And in 1 Peter 2, 5, it says, Come, like and like living stoles, stones, be yourself built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. I looked at that in terms of looking at Psalm 23 and said, you know, we are those living stones. Each one of us, no matter what our backgrounds are, no matter where we are in this world, form an integral part of his house. Without you, without me, fulfilling that and doing what we're supposed to do, that stone won't be as perfect as he has made it. And do we allow that? Do we allow ourselves to be weighed down by everything that goes on in the earth? Julie's mother, one of her favorite sayings, everything, I do worry about this and I do worry about that and I do worry about this. How many people do we know use the word worry all the time? when it's just not needed because worry brings on anxiety. Anxiety brings on other feelings and so forth. And before you know where we are, it feels like we're carrying the whole world on our shoulders and we're not fulfilling what God has told us. So let me read Psalm 23 for you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me down to lie in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul and he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to take parts of Psalm 23. It was a six-week study that our, our house group did, uh, so I'm not going to go through all six weeks in uh, an, an hour or so for you. But just looking at Psalm, Psalm 23. First one said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Do we really get what he means by I shall not want? Do we really know? Because in Matthew, Matthew 6, verse 25 to, thir to 34, you will find there are seven reasons in there why we should not worry. And one of those is found in between verses 32 and 30, 31 and 32. Worry, when I read this and researched it and looked it up, I didn't find this out, but I looked through the internet and found this. It's like, wow, worrying shows a lack of faith in God. Whew, I tell you, that word dropped from my vocabulary just like that. Do we really know who the shepherd is? So what I want to do tonight is really just take a preamble walk through, looking what a shepherd was like back in biblical times, but obviously at the same time in modern times now, the shepherds do the, uh, uh, similar things, and take through what the, what, the shepherd, what the shepherd does. So worrying shows a lack of faith and understanding in God. The shepherd, what the shepherd does is what? Is to look after the flock all the time. They make sure the flock is in good health. They look after the flock. They feed the flock, they ward off enemies, etc. They're there all the time. When the shepherd is around, the sheep are very peaceful and calm. 
If you really get into looking at Psalm 23 in, in a great deal, it's absolutely amazing what is in there. So three titles for the shepherd, isn't there? We all know the three titles for the shepherd. I'm not going to ask anybody. If anyone who wants to shout them out, we can do. But in Hebrews, he says he's the great shepherd. He's the great shepherd. In John, he says, I am the good shepherd. And in Peter, 1 Peter 5, verse 4, he says, I am the chief shepherd. Really, tonight, looking at the, sh looking at the shepherd, I really want us to get a hold of who he is in our lives and what he is, what he, what he is about. So he makes, in verse 2 it says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Can we picture up, I mean, we've had some fantastic weather for March, haven't we? Hey, I see some suntans around here. Not the solarium type, but the natural type. Fantastic, isn't it? March, 18, 22 degrees. Barbecues are out. So let's think, using the, the temperature out there, think of yourself in the fields sitting underneath the nice shade of a tree on a warm summer's afternoon. There's rolling fields in front of you, there's grass in front of you, there's a nice stream going down in front of you. It's picture yourself there with the sheep dotted around in the fields. It's really, if we capture that essence, it's very peaceful, isn't it? And very, our minds are very good at going and looking at those pictures and thinking, yeah, that's very, very peaceful. But when we are peace at peace, the shepherd is there. It's amazing. Everything just quietens down. There's no noise around. We're just still in him. There's twice, well, there's more than twice, but I'll tell you a couple of stories first. In terms of uh, when I found his peace early on in my walk, I was working in Birmingham. I came back using public transport, and I had to go and get my bus to get home to get our son to the doctor's. And I just found, I was just totally peaceful. And as I went to run for the bus, in, in where we're coming from in Wolverhampton, the bus actually left its, its docking. So I went running down the middle, the bus coming towards me, which is a foolish thing to do anyway. I remember waving at the bus driver, stop. He said, no. But I remember saying, well, bless you. Walked in, phoned Julie up, and I said, uh, just missed the bus, but I'm sure one will be along in a minute. So in Wol what the old bus station in Wolverhampton, they used to come out of their uh, dockings up and there's a little round about the top and off they would go. I hadn't finished the conversation and the bus turned up. Same number. So I said, excuse me, I'm going to go now because my bus is here. The one's come, I'm being blessed. The doors opened up and as the doors opened up, the bus driver said the following words to me. Please forgive me, I left a minute early. I've come back for you. Thank you, Lord. I blessed him. I turned around. There was 30 people there with their mouths open, and I just laughed. It's just that you've got no idea. i got no idea what he's just done, but he sent the bus up. The bus come round, and that was his exact words. Please forgive me. I left a minute early. I've come back for you. So when you're in his peace, all sorts of things happen. I had another, uh, another quick story. We did some, uh, we had a contract in Fenlands working for a council down there. And it was a three-hour drive. So in a three-hour drive, what am I going to listen to? Worship, music, whatever. Just building yourself up. Because I knew what I was going into was apparently a very aggressive organization that they were all lawyers there, and they were very, very aggressive. And the, the person who ran the training department said, I'm not sure whether he'll be able to cope with it, but the director said, I'm sure he can. When I went down there, they met me, took me into the room, and... You couldn't hear a pin drop. I said what I had to say. I finished, and when we left, the head of the training department said, oh, I haven't got a clue what happened there. Why were they like that? And I thought, well, I know, because I know who went before me. But anyway, shorting the story even more, after three months' work down there, the head of the department, the director of that department, called me in and said, thank you. I think you know I'm a Christian. I said, I've heard rumours but in that environment, you couldn't mention anything with the political correctness. She said, I'm a Christian. I've been praying for three years for God to send somebody. 
Now you're here, you've done what you've done. I can now go in peace and move on to where I've got to go to. Praise God, you, you don't know. So we both got down on our knees, on our knees, on, in our office. If anybody walked in, they would have thought, what is going on there? Right? But they, we kept down on our knees, gave thanks to the Lord, and think that was a job done. We've never been back since because I don't think that's what he wants us. You can't keep chasing the work. He's going to open the doors. So when you know when you're in peace and you know you're sitting under the trees, the grass is the, the picture I try to describe. When you're in peace, all sorts of things happen. It's when we start attracting all the world stuff going on, then things start going out, out of alignment. But if you read, go through the Bible, I can't remember how many times it says it, but there's one animal it likens us to, and that is sheep. So there's a lot of barbells in here tonight, eh? What? Nah, there we go. <laughs> For sheep, if you go back and you, you look at it, because we're in a fast food society, aren't we? You go to the supermarket, you get your food, you come home. We don't go back into the fields as we used to do years and years ago. But if you look at the sheep, sheep are very nervous creatures. When you start drawing the similarities between the sheep and us, it's quite startling. So sheep have to, the things have to be absolutely right for the sheep to be still, for the sheep to be calm. There needs to be no wild animals around where they are. They don't know how to find good pasture. Hello? They need a shepherd to show them where the good pasture is. They can't go around spraying bug repellent on them. So they need the shepherd to dunk them in the old mix once a year to, to clean them. Can't go around spraying stuff on themselves. So the conditions, for the sheep to lie down, and you think about ourselves and our own lives, they need four conditions to do that. They need to be free of fear, so they can lie down and rest. Are we free of fear as Christians, each and every day? They need to be free of tension, friction with other sheep. How many times do we find ourselves in conflict with other people? And it's how we deal with those conflicts, that defines who we are in Christ. They need to be free of parasites. I'm not going to check anybody, okay? But are we free of parasites? Those things that people have spoken over us in the past, right or wrong. Those things that maybe, you know, for me, when I was at school, uh, I left school and I went into the Air Force and the uh, teacher said, Michael, do all right in the physical education department there but he won't mount to much academically. That's a good one. I wasn't really too bothered about it, but I spent years going back, getting my maths and English sorted out, going back and getting a postgrad diploma in management and in training. In the end, I thought, who am I proving this to? But it's surprising how many people still today that teachers are still saying to people the wrong things. Uh, another charity that we work with, one of the people there, I won't mention the names, said to this young lady, I'll call her, hopefully nobody's called Ethel here. I apologise if anybody is, but so the trouble is with you, Ethel, Ethel, you're thick. You just need to find a rich husband because <laughs> you ain't going to do anything. What words of encouragement is that given to somebody? And we find this time and time again, both in, 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 in Alan partnership, but mainly in the charity and in the ministry. Still as Christians, we've still got stuff that's hung on from the past and we haven't got rid of it. We haven't broken it off to set us totally free. I mean, look at your, your, your logo there. The cross with the chains broken. You know, that's what Jude and I were blessed with and it's helping people to break off those mindset, mindset changes. And one of the mindset changes we use when we're with, working uh, with our program called Be Who You Can Be in Christ, we, just, we finished uh, late last year uh, within a Baptist church running our, our program, and it is about setting people free. And there was a lady on the front row there, and we both felt real compassion for her, because the end of her nose was a great big cancerous lump. And she was so self-conscious, it was a big growth, and her face was like this all the time. When we finished the, the first session, we went into the car, Julie started praying, I started in tongues, and we declared that that cancer has to go, we want to get a good report when we come back next week. Well, we didn't recognise her next week, because she sat back in the front row with a whopping great big beam on her face, and she said, you know what, I woke up in the morning, there was no cancer, it had gone, I couldn't find it anywhere. They think, wow, 
Oh, I don't know how he does it. He just says, pray in faith. And it happens. And it's got a walking into it, isn't it? But it's amazing. I mean, whatever we said to her, it doesn't matter. It, her face, she was so... In, oh, it's like that bright light there. It just shone out because it, was, it wasn't there anymore. Anyway, also, sheep need to be free of hunger. So those are the four conditions that sheep need. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 said, and For his divine power bestowed, bestowed on us all things that are re requisite and suited to a life of goodness. So he's planted all things ahead of us. As we go briefly through this little walk, you'll find that the shepherds do that for the sheep. That's why he makes us to lie down in green pastures. Because everything is already out there for us. We need our hearts, our eyes open to what is out there. The second part of the verse says, he leads me beside the still waters. Do you know sheep won't, generally speaking, drink from a fast flowing river? They won't drink from a babbling, noisy brook. They like still waters. So if there's none around what the shepherd used to do, you go back into the biblical times and it's probably still happening today, they would dam up a small part of the stream to provide the still water for the sheep to be able to get their water. But sheep also can go quite some time without drinking because they, if you go back into Palestine, the nights are very cold, the days are quite hot, and in the morning you get the morning dew. So that's where they get, they can last for about four months, apparently, sheep, because they'll just take the morning dew. Do we, when we get up early in the morning, do we take in his word in the morning dew? Do we read it? Do we look at it? Do we give him thanks for the day? I'm not condemning anyone, I'm just saying it, it's, the morn, it's the morning dew. So, the Bible in John 7 says, If any man thirst, let him come and drink. Do we, or how often do we go and drink of those living waters? I know that we, in my, our hearts now is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, well for me, it's, it's a rising passion to get people to step out of, that's for somebody else. I can't speak. Everyone in this room and everyone that listens to this video has got a voice. They have got a voice to be heard. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be the biggest evangelist in the world. That one word of encouragement from somebody can spark off all sorts of things. I think John Maxwell puts it, are we a lifter or are we a leaner? The leaners take away your energy. The lifters, they lift you up on eagle's wings. Fly higher and away. Surely he lifts us up and our role as Christians is to be able to encourage one another, help one another, help each other grow to be released into whatever the destiny God has for each and every one of us. Because without you, those living stones I mentioned early on, part of his plan won't be able to be completed because he needs every one of us. Each and every one of us has something. As I said, you know, Julie, six years before I gave my life, there were some interesting times there, wasn't there? I think there were times when I nearly packed the bag. Not quite, but the love that came out of this woman for me. We are as one. You know, people look at us as the odd couple, really. Because we would say some of our best days are when we're both teaching together. We both do very similar jobs. So we, we obviously live married and wife. One is husband and wife. We're on the business. So if Julie's doing something, I could be doing something different. Or we co could be both teaching. Or we run the charity and we're both, we're both doing it. Or we run the ministry and we're both doing it. We love being together. And because we know when we're together, there's the power there. There's one of each other feeding off one another. And also, well, all of us, Christ is there. I just, I just find it amazing. But he does lead us beside those still waters. Sweep, uh, sweep. Sheep aren't generally good swimmers. Because if you look at them with their coats, they pick up all sorts of muck, all sorts of rubbish. Their coats are long. And if they get too wet, they'll drown. You know, I know I haven't got it in tonight, but just to let you know something useful. The, the sheep muck is probably the most profitable out because when the shepherd puts his sheep into a field and they've been in that field for some time, there's some of the best fertilizer there. 
So those fields afterwards are the most productive for what they, they're doing, you know, for producing wheat, barley, or whatever it is. It's, a, it's just a fact. But who created all this? But do we watch nature? Do we really see nature at work? Do we look at nature and say, yeah, well, there's lessons to be learned from there? In verse 3, it says, He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is some of the key bits I want to get to tonight and, and illuminate on other areas there. The shepherd, if you go back to the biblical times, the shepherd, the shep, shepherd rather, would take his sheep down to winter pastures. So they'd house them over the winter because especially in the higher grounds, it's snow and cold, I'm not going to go there. Why would you want to go out all day with it being looking after sheep in the snow? But in the summer, the interesting thing is that he would go out once or twice before he took the sheep up to high pastures. And in doing so, he would look at the lay of the land to see what's there. The Bible tells us the Lord goes before us and the Lord God of Israel covers our earwood. Surely that's happening to each and every one of us, walking out in that faith. So the shepherd goes out beforehand. He goes to the fields, but the interesting thing, he will also deposit minerals, salt and other things at various places around. And when I was reading this and researching this, I was thinking, yeah, wow. Where have I had my eyes closed, Lord? Where have you deposited things that I should have seen? so then I could feed and then sow into somebody else's life. And then when he takes the sheep up there, whether when he's going up or they're coming downhill, sheep are quite not that intelligent animal, are they? They will follow just straight lines. And if they go like that, the shepherd has got to make sure, especially if they're coming downhill, he takes them in a zigzag, gentle way down, because they will follow the shepherd. Sometimes going in the straightest path because you can see the prize at the end is not necessarily the best way. Sometimes we might have to do a little detour over here and a little detour over there. But it's not in our will, it's in, it's in his will that's, that's happening. Isaiah 55 within this, when I looked at all this, there are three requests in Isaiah 55 verses 1 to 3. It says in there quite clearly, come and drink. Come and take. Come to me. I'm talking to myself mainly here because you know, we can get caught up in the business of the world. How often do I come in and drink from him? How often do I come and take from him? How often do I go to him for things? I think I do it quite often, but I don't think it's quite nearly enough. You know, making sure that he's there for us, he's there for me. The Bible tells us that we can inquire and require of the Lord. When I heard that, I thought, I thought this was always a one-way thing. Do you mean I can actually say to the Lord, Lord, I'd like you to help me out here. Lord, I'd like you to do that. It was such a revelation for, for me. So, coming to the Valley of the Cash Sheep. So why am I talking at the, the Valley of the Cash Sheep? Because it doesn't mention anywhere in the Bible the Valley of the Cash Sheep, does it? It's probably biblical scholars in here. But anyway, in, Psalm, in 1 Peter 7, it says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. But the key scripture within this is in Psalm 42, 11. Why are you cast down, O my inner self? When we're feeling troubled, when we're feeling worried, we're concerned rather, we do say, oh, my soul is cast down. Cast down. Cast down is not a good position to be in. In Job 22, 29, he says, When men are cast down, they shall say, There is a lifting up, and he shall save the hum humble person. Cast down in sheep means they've turned over. Cast down in the Hebrew is, is called sure fell, to humble, to bring yourself down cast down so again I'll sat on our knees in front of the Lord in terms of the sheep it's an entirely different thing but it's liking it to us when we walk through different trials we do go cast down part of the verse said he restores my soul in the word restore the Hebrew shub says to bring back to restore to refresh 
to repair. As I said, the sheep, when they are cast down, they turn over. I thought, I've never seen it. Have you ever seen a sheep turned on its back with its legs up? Would we all like to try it now? Lie on your back, sweet legs and arms up? No? No volunteers? Okay. I'm not going to do it. Right? But simply saying, they, the sheep turn themselves over. So how do the sheep turn themselves over? Well, it could be the fact that they've, they've rested in a hollow. They may be pregnant. Wool's heavy. But they do turn over. It, cast sheep is an old English saying. And when we're cast, it means, if you ask a farmer, in fact, when I was doing this in the home group, one of the, uh, the gentlemen there, his friend was a farmer, so not only did I think I was talking about the right thing, I had to convince him this was right. And he'd go, yes, you're right there. That's an old English saying. Cash sheep means you're turned over. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we're turned over, that exposes our bellies, as it were, to the predators, to the acts of the enemy, to come in and, and start having a go at us. But who do we need? We need Christ to come and turn us back over, which is what the shepherd does. The sheep will die within a very short uh, space of time if they are not turned back over. So, with the shepherd, looking after his sheep, taking them, taking them out of the... the uh, turning them over. When that sheep becomes cast, an interesting thing I found out is that the stomach pressure builds up and cuts off the circulation. The blood cannot do its job. Where are we stopping the blood from doing its job with us and with those that we're speaking to? The sheep will perish if they're not turned back over very quickly. As I said, there's a number of ways that could happen. They could be pregnant, turned over. They could be lying in a little hollow. They fall in, turn over, or they'll be walking down a steep hill, turn over. I've never seen a sheep that's been cast like that. But after researching it, I've put cast sheep into the internet. As you know, nowadays you can Google anything, can't you? So I Googled it, and there were pictures turning up with sheep, sheep turned over. I thought, wow, it's true. But thus, liking it to ourselves there. So if they become heavy laden, do we carry some of the sins of the world? Do we carry some of the things that people have spoken over us that weren't good in the past, but maybe we've forgotten about it? And we're wondering why we haven't got breakthrough in certain situations. So the valley of the cash sheep is quite key for me because it, what it means is those sheep should have their, their wools sheared off every year, shouldn't be dirty, whatever we're carrying is always going to the cross to allow the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse us, to enrich us, to clean us, to move, to move forward. The next verse says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Have you ever been led to a situation that you didn't know why and you suddenly found out why he had been given a particular word for somebody? Let me explain. Two years ago, we went for the second time out to Uganda and we went about 500 miles down south to a place called uh, Barara to Pastor Alex's church. It was out in Banana Plantation. It was fantastic to the worship there. They were there since 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. Absolutely awesome. Anyway, Julie and I were working on our, um, our sermons, and, and I had Joshua on my heart. I don't know why, but he placed Joshua on my heart. And I got an email in from Uganda saying, Pastor Alex wants to know what you're calling the conference. And I just felt the Spirit said, we're crossing the Jordan. Two days later, I got an email back said, Pastor Alex is so ecstatic, he can't wait for you to come. We just called it crossing the Jordan. Didn't know that, the reason why. Went down there, and it's a three-day conference, so if it go through Joshua, it takes them three days before they, the Lord says to Joshua, prepare your people, three days you will cross the Jordan. So everything biblically fell into what we were doing. And on the second day, he called us into his office, which the year before, there was nothing there. This was literally some framework, nothing there, fields or bananas. Now they were clear, there was offices there, blocks there, fantastic. And he sat down excited and he said, Michael Julie, look. He turned around his book, which he writes what the Lord has given to him, and he said, look at this. On the 31st of December last year, the Lord told me, you and your house will cross the Jordan. You never know what you've got to do, do you? 
So the second, the third day, 500 excited people. Literally, we got some some rags, uh, some cloths out there, coloured blue to represent the water. We broke the water. They all walked over, closed it, put the 12 rocks there, as it said in the Bible. And that church has never looked back. They've seen witch doctors galore give their lives to the Lord. They've been out on missions and to the lost and the hurting, and they've all, all come in. It's just a fantastic testimony. See, when the Lord tells you to do something, you, we ought to uh, obey it. So we need to, in terms of the cash sheep, is let the Lord turn us over. Because he doesn't want to leave you lying on your back, exposed to the enemy. He knows that if he doesn't turn you around, you will die. But sometimes sheep are quite stubborn. They will carry on the same paths. And you know when things aren't right. I know when things are right because you keep going down the same route and wondering why you keep hitting your head against a brick wall. <laughs> it doesn't work. Right. The next verse tells us we go through the valley of the shadow of death. Remember, it, it doesn't say you're staying in the valley of the shadow of death. It says that you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It means we're going through trials and tribulations, but we're walking through because it's only a shadow. It's not complete darkness. So we're always walking through. Have you ever heard of the, the term rodding of the sheep? Rodding of the sheep? Well, let me help you. Because it says in the next verse, thy rod and staff, they... Okay. So we look at the rod and the staff. The rod represents the shepherd's protection of authority. One, it's used in a form of defense because at one end, in, in biblical terms, it was studded, so to ward off animals. The rodding of the sheep is also there to bring the sheep close to him. Now, if we, if, if you read this or listen to this afterwards, if you go to Ezekiel 20, 37, it says, And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Okay? So the staff represents his guidance and tender compassion for the sheep. So it's basically saying that when we go under the rod, the shepherd brings his sheep under the rod to look for any parasites, to correct them, to move them forward, to sort them out where there are things wrong with them. But Ezekiel 20, 37 says, I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of covenant. How many of us would want that to happen to us? How often have we come under the rod? Once I found out this, I said, well, Lord, take me under the rod. Take me under the rod so I know what's on me and I knew you can get rid of it and move, and move me forward. So I just wanted to preamble and, and go, through, go through this, but coming under the rod is a very important area. We don't want to be cash sheep, but going under the rod, as it says in Ezekiel, says he's going to bring you under covenant, covenant, which means he's going to look at each and every one of us, look at what's there, come under close inspection. Not just a quick walk through, dunk into the uh, cleansing liquid and out you go again. This is a close inspection of who we are to take us out and into what he has got lined up for yourself. I'll give you a few questions to look at if when we know we're under the rod. Do I deposit a blessing behind me or am I an irritation to other people? If you're in irritation, we need to go back under the rod. Do I leave behind peace with me, or do I leave behind turmoil? Do I leave behind contentment or conflict? Do I leave behind flowers of joy or frustration? I see one or two people are smiling here. It's che it checked me out when I looked at, looked at all this because it's like, wow. Put me under the rod because I know sometimes we can all get frustrated. We're human beings. And if you're frustrated, you don't leave the, the blessing there. You don't leave the peace there. So it's keep going back to the Lord and saying, help me. So if we're going to the valley of the, the cash sheep, really it's saying, it's time we really looked at stepping out. Because one of the other verses says, surely in goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Goodness, if you look at it through the dictionary, it means it's not a passive quality, it's an active quality. 
he has given us the choice to choose the right path or to choose the wrong path. We have that choice. He's not going to make it for us. We have that choice in our own mind to say, I'm choosing goodness. Because if I choose goodness, surely mercy and peace are going to follow me. We always say in the charity, wherever we're going to do, is whatever you leave your thumbprint behind, what is the thumbprint you leave behind with other people? Because if you don't leave the right thumbprint, maybe we wonder why there's not too many knocks on the door saying, I'd like to be friends with you. Maybe we're not getting enough calls in to say, hey, how you doing, Michael? Or people don't want to know you. Maybe I've been leaving the wrong thumbprint behind with people. We do see in the ministry and, in the, and with the charity, a lot of Christians walking around as cash sheep, and they're walking around with, in the valley of the shadow of death because they're taking all the worldly weight on, side, on them. Instead of leaving it to the Lord, they try and deal with it themselves. The Bible says and tells us that we do not have a spirit of timidity, but we have one of power and a sound mind. And that's what we should look at. You know, speaking to me here as well, I'm thinking, yeah, let's not get timidity, let's get out here. It's not natural for anybody to stand out here and talk to other people. We're all happy to sit down and talk, but to come out, it suddenly means there's all these eyes looking at you, you think, aye, aye, they're all looking at me. All right? But it's making sure that you've got the confidence to do it. I know what he's told me to do, and he's told Julie to do. So if I don't obey what he's telling me to do, well, one of the things he's told me to do is to feed my lambs and feed my sheep. And whatever I've got, if I come up against a scholar who's been a Christian for years, then I'll, I'll bow to that knowledge, but I'm just doing what I've been asked to do. So I do believe, and looking at the times we're in now, we ought to be stepping out as Christians. Stepping out. You look at the turmoil that's going on. I don't want to raise a political statement, but you look at what's possibly happening in the government in terms of marriage. I'm not going to go into that, but is it not time we stepped out? David did with Goliath. He stepped out of the crowd and said, I don't want to be one of them. I am unique. I have something to offer, and I will fight that man. Joshua and Caleb, look at them. They went out as the 12 spies. They went out, and what happened? Ten of them said, there's now put trouble there, lad. And they said, no, we can beat them. It doesn't matter how big they are, we can beat them. We have the good God of Israel with us. We can beat them. What happened? They almost got stoned, didn't they? People rose up against them. Sometimes it hurts to step out of the crowd and be counted and to say what you really believe if you're being followed by the Lord. Bartimaeus did that as well. If you remember, he cried out, Jesus, bring back my sight. Save me, heal me. What did the crowd do? Sit down, shut up. Keep quiet, lad. You can't speak out like that. That's Jesus. I know it's Jesus. That's why I want him. You know, when... Jesus is our shepherd, really is our shepherd. So we know when we're in the, the valley of Kashyyyk because maybe we're turned over. We don't do things right. When we're being, coming under the rod, coming under close inspection, sometimes it's painful to look at what's inside, and, but sometimes that's what needs to come out of us so I can speak to somebody and say, do you know Jesus loves you? He really does love you. Open your heart and mind to him because there's salvation there. All the troubles you had in the world will disappear. Just allow him to love you. Allow him to walk into your life. Every major issue in your life will be settled. So you know who you are. You know where you've come from. You know where you're going to. All of us have that divine destiny. And if you really take time to look through Psalm 23 and do some research on it, there's some wonderful stuff that comes out of there. Because like many people, I read it, and the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and recited it, without really knowing what it all means. He'll go before you. He'll deposit minerals or goodness before you. He will go before you. He will cover your rearward. When you get cast, troubled with the world, world's worries of the world, he will there to turn you over. Or he'll bring somebody into your life to give you that one word of encouragement, and he'll just say, Wow, I needed that. I really needed that because I was in a dark place. I was crying my eyes out and I just needed that. So like restless sheep, 
Sometimes we can never be content, can we? You look at the world, look at the time, we all start rushing around, busyness in life. The television comes on, the mobile phone, somebody texts you, the internet's on, things are there to try and take us away. And it's, it's a call tonight to come back to the real shepherd, the good, the great, and the chief shepherd. Until we recognize who he is, we know all know who he is, but as the shepherd, what a shepherd does to his sheep, he will look after them. He will take them to those green pastures. He will make sure the predators are kept away from them. And when they get overladen with things, as sheep do, and they go cast, he will be there gently to turn them over. Otherwise, the blood will not do its work. And it's important for that to happen. So I would like to conclude tonight with, with, with a prayer. And I invite you to, to join in with me. So you can say after me, I'll pause, and if you want to join in with me, you, you can do. It's really it's about acknowledging that the, the Lord is the real, the good, the chief, and the great shepherd of my life. That Lord Jesus, I acknowledge the need of you in my life, and I accept you as my Lord and Savior, and the shepherd of my life. I invite you in now to be the Lord and Shepherd of my life, my spirit, and my relationship with you, my body, and my behavior, my mind, and my thinking, my tongue, and the things that I say. My emotions, my emotions and my reactions, and my, reactions. My, will, my will and all of my decisions, of my, decisions. My, time, my time my home my family, my family and my possessions, my possessions. Of, all I do, of all the work I do and all the things I put my hand to and all of my relationships. Thank you, Lord, that from this moment, I know I will shine brightly amongst this dark and cruel nation for you on this earth, representing you in all that I do as your ambassador. I thank you, Lord, that your blood was shed, that I might be free. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Have a fantastic walk with our shepherd. May he lead you into those green pastures. I pray that he keeps the wolves and everything off you, that he opens your spiritual eyes, your hearts of your understanding, so those deposits he's put ahead of you, you will find. Be encouraged and have a great walk with him. Thank you.